holding uh, this year's Emerging Technology Symposium uh, here in 2012 during an election year was, was not a, a coincidence. Uh, the symposium planners wanted to provide a, a panel discussion on policy issues that are shaping the water and energy efficiency related industries. It, it appears they have assembled in a, an esteemed list of panelists that will easily deliver on that goal. Our first panelist, A. Hunter Fanny, comes to us from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Dr. Fanny is the chief of and a supervisory mechanical engineer in the Building Environment Division of the Engineering Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. In 2009, Dr. Fanny was recognized with the Department of Commerce Silver Medal for the development of, of appliance test procedures that form the basis of the U.S. Appliance Energy Labeling Program. Next is Mr. Joshua Johnson from the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee Minority Staff. Josh has served in the, in the United States Congress for the last 17 years and has worked for both the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives. Mr. Johnson is currently a professional staff member for the U.S. Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Mr. Johnson has a master's degree from the London School of Economics and a master's degree in national security and strategic studies from the U.S. Naval War College. Mr. K Kevin Campshire comes to us from the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings of the General Services Administration. Mr. Campshire was a project manager for the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center and he has lectured at various universities such as MIT, Harvard, and Yale. He has worked for GSA for over 37 years and is a graduate of Yale University. Ms. Kelly A. Chris is also from the, the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee from the, from the majority staff. Kelly earned a BA with honors in geology and marine science from Middlebury College, an MS in oceanography from the Graduate School of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island, and a PhD in earth science from Boston University. She subsequently conducted postdoctoral research at Stanford University. Chris Miller is a senior policy advisor on energy and environmental issues for U.S. Senator Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader. He handles many Nevada-specific matters in these areas, as well as helping coordinate related policy and legislative priorities for the Senate Democratic Caucus. He has an MS in Natural Resource Management, Planning, and Policy, and a BA in Political Science from the University of Michigan. Ed Osan is a Senior Water Policy Analyst with the Natural Resources Defense Council's Water Programs, working from NRDC's office in Santa Monica. In this capacity, he oversees an interdisciplinary team of eight professionals working to advance regional, state, and national policies and technologies that improve the efficiency of water use. He received a, a master's degree in urban and regional planning from George Washington University and a bachelor's degree in international relations from Georgetown University. In 2010, Ed received the Mike Moynihan Excellence Award for statewide innovation in water conservation from the California Urban Water Conservation Council. You may refer to the, the longer version of our panelist bios in your program. Please welcome your panelists. Uh, let's start with a, a general question for all of the panelists. At virtually every water efficiency event one attends, we're reminded about the US EPA forecast that no less than 36 states will have to deal with water shortage related issues by next year. And here we are in 2012, and I'm sure that our attendees would like to hear from you regarding where we are today in terms of our water challenges here in the United States. Now, Chris, why don't you start first? Well, I don't, I'm not as equipped as some of the other panelists to talk about the uh, serious details, the scientific details of the water problems that we face. Um, I am in my current position far more uh, comfortable talking about the political landscape than necessarily the uh, water science uh, landscape. Um, but I think, uh, I think some of you know uh, and heard from earlier today from Southern Nevada Water Authority uh, about Nevada's situation, which informs a lot of what my boss uh, prioritizes. 
Um, Nevada is the driest state in the country. I think it gets less than nine inches a year statewide uh, of rainfall every year. Southern Nevada gets probably less than five inches. So water is constantly on his mind. Um, efficient use of water, water conservation, finding new supplies that are clean and reliable are really, really important to him. Um, he has worked on water efficiency bills, incentives. Um, he has uh, also far started focusing in recent years on, on uh, climate resiliency because water management issues are going to be profoundly more complicated as we go into the future, both on a, on a regional level, national level, but a global level too. And that's going to require a lot, more, uh, a lot more work than we've done in the past. We've kind of taken water for granted in, in a lot of ways, and we can no longer do that. Uh, infrastructure is very close to his heart. He believes that we are underinvesting in, in, um, in all levels of infrastructure related to public goods like water services, uh, electricity, and energy, and things like that. Um, he uh, has also pressed for, uh, in the past, pressed for green building funds to really start to push the envelope, um, so to speak, on the science and the integration of our any energy infrastructure with our building sector. Um, we haven't, also again, in the building sector, we haven't done nearly as much. I think a building, I've, I've heard presentations where uh, experts said buildings that we use today are very, very similar to the ones that we built 100 years ago. And we, we, we have a lot more that we can do. Um, I'll just say one note. Uh, one of the things that people asked me to talk about today was the outlook for legislation. Um, it's dim, uh, unfortunately. Uh, even things like WaterSense, WaterSmart, the kinds of um, uh, voluntary programs that we've talked about um, and funded partly in the Recovery Act and, and other things have come under fire uh, now. Government has turned into a bad word, uh, which is unfortunate because it's uh, the way that we can move forward most quickly on some of, uh, adopting some of the standards and, and codes and things that you all work on a lot. And without a concerted push, whether it's a, a mandate or an incentive or some public-private uh, partnership, it's hard to see how we're going to get implementation done in any kind of a time frame that we actually need in order to uh, improve public health um, and make a more secure energy future. So hopefully we won't, um, we won't go much further down that road, um, but some of you may know, just as a, an example, the, uh, the light bulb efficiency standard that has been talked about in recent years. Um, that was part of, a, of the 2000 energy, the bipartisan 2000 energy bill, which uh, President Bush signed, um, and it sets an efficiency standard for light bulbs. But people turned that into a, we want to ban light bulbs the same light bulbs you might have used in about 1900, but it's nonetheless it turned into a completely nonsensical, fact-free debate. And I'm just hoping that we're, we're going to go back to the era where the private sector and government are allowed to work together in a, in a comfortable and productive kind of way. Anybody else? Ed, Ed I, I would imagine that you have some thoughts about our water challenges. <clears throat> we, we sure do. Um, uh, part of the context that, that uh, Chris has to consider and the rest of us have to consider is a, a very substantial uh, infrastructure needs that our community water and wastewater uh, systems are facing. I think the current estimates are something over a half a trillion dollars in uh, water and wastewater capital needs over the next uh, 20 years or so. Um, water and sewer rates have been going up. They've been going up at about twice the rate of inflation over the last 15 years. And at the same time, um, water use in the residential sector has been going down. It's been going down, it's been observed to be going down at a rate of about 1% per year, also for about the last uh, 15 years. Uh, there are both big challenges and opportunities 
uh, in these dynamics. And uh, one of the initiatives in response to both resource concerns and concerns about affordability uh, that we're working on at uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council is an initiative we call 25 by 25. And quite simply, that is a goal when looking at residential water use uh, in the middle, by the middle of the next decade for new construction, water used in new residential construction uh, to uh, represent about 25% of the typical residential water use today. In other words, a 75% reduction um, for newly built homes and apartments. Uh, we think this is quite possible. We think it's quite attainable through a combination of improved efficiency in both indoor and outdoor use. Um, combination of, of measures could include um, water sense or slightly uh, better uh, plumbing products, uh, Energy Star or slightly better uh, clothes washers, um, a reduction in uh, customer side leakage with a combination of more accurate uh, customer water meters and more uh, available uh, and more granular uh, meter reading data through automated metering infrastructure, which is a technology and approach that we're also encouraging. Uh, more efficient regional uses of water uh, in residential applications like whole house humidifiers in northern climates uh, and uh, uh, more efficient uh, water softeners and water conditioning equipment uh, in places where that kind of uh, application is needed. These indoor uses uh, can be further uh, drawn down, potable use indoors can be further drawn down through on-site uh, gray water treatment and reuse, uh, capturing gray water from showers and lavatories uh, laboratory faucets uh, to use for flushing toilets and basically taking toilet flushing completely out of the potable uh, water supply. With regard to outdoor water use, which is in broad terms roughly half of residential water use, you look at uh, ways of uh, making landscapes, uh, basically taking landscape off of publicly supplied potable water. Uh, landscapes that have more creative uses of, of non-irrigated space. An example might be to uh, adapt um, uh, playground uh, ground covers uh, for attractive and safe uh, backyard play spaces that don't require irrigation. Uh, and for the irrigation that, for the landscapes that the, the living plant material that remains, uh, basically supporting that from natural precipitation, uh, captured or harvested rainwater, and additional application of on-site uh, gray water. And in some cases, produced water from sump pumping and uh, air conditioning uh, concentrate. Um, we think this is entirely possible and, and uh, quite doable. Uh, we intend to be working through, uh, working with various code bodies uh, that develop uh, model building and plumbing codes to work towards accommodation of these kinds of technologies and practices. And the advantages of, of having breakthrough efficiencies in, in new construction is that with the, with the downward trend in consumption of current customers, uh, we're seeing per capita or per household water use drop, but absolute consumption may still be growing in growing communities. If we have breakthrough efficiency in new, newly added uh, residences, uh, we could see uh, the capital requirements for growth being removed from the infrastructure equation. And we can concentrate on concentrate our infrastructure dollars on repair, replacement, and upgrade of our existing water and wastewater capacity without the added billions for 
uh, expanding that capacity to serve uh, new growth, which could be coming in at a much more efficient level. So that's kind of how we see that coming together, and that's a combination. You'll, you'll notice that that it doesn't require a whole lot from the federal government. Um, uh, it's very helpful to, to be able to maintain uh, voluntary programs like WaterSense and Energy Star. Uh, WaterSense, in particular, is uh, struggling for funding. Uh, but those are very modest investments in the overall scheme of things compared to the you know, $600 billion or so of capital investment that we're looking at for community water and wastewater uh, systems. But a lot of this can be done at the state and local level and should be done at the state and local level. I'd love to hear from any, any of our other panelists on where you think we, we stand today on the water challenges here in, in the U.S. I'll, I'll take a historical approach. I, I spent 10 years on the House, uh, for the, working for the House of Representatives Water and Power Subcommittee. During that 10 years, the bulk of it was spent on one bill. It was a bill to deal with California water. So here we are in Washington, D.C., trying to figure out ways to move water from the north, in California, to the south. Every year we get some momentum, we lose momentum. We figure out how to pull this group over to the potential of passing the bill, then we lose that group. In the meantime, the entire state's figuring out, you know, legislatively, it looks like there's problems. What, are, what can we do internally? And they continue to work on different aspects. They continue to develop their recycling capacity. In, in, a, in a certain case, they developed a new reservoir. And at the same point, you had utilities who were heavily investing in uh, products that would consume less water and in many cases consume less energy. And also a lot of creative thought is how do we move water around the state of California at what times? And also what are we doing to uh, further incentivize folks uh, in, in, in their homes and in buildings to, re to use less water? So we finally passed this bill and we realized that in the state of California where you think there'd be a tremendous water problem, they continue to maintain their water use for even the, the similar water use that they were using a couple decades ago by all the innovations that are occurring. Even though the, the legislation did pass, the bulk almost entirely, the, the new water that was developed in California was done through a, a wide range of uh, incentive-based programs. What I found interesting though, during this time, there was a group in Southern California who, uh, the gentleman who was a water manager, his wife was Australian. And he would go to Australia uh, quite often. And of course, if you love water, you hang out with people in Australia that love water and who have similar struggles. And he'd always come back and tell me about the struggles that the Australians were having with water conservation. So a few years ago, uh, four years ago, the first time I came in contact with IAPMO, we were thinking, are there opportunities to figure out what happens when we conserve a lot of water? And Southern Californians were starting to fill some of the challenges with re uh, not recycling water, but uh, using less water in some of their new buildings. And at that time, we tasked the Congressional Research Service, which is the uh, research side of Congress, that you have a, a lot of capable uh, analysts that will take questions from uh, the members of Congress and staff that need addressed. And the question that we posed to them was, what's the carrying capacity uh, for drain lines leaving buildings and what should it be and, and if you conserve water, what are the challenges? And that all came about because this uh, gentleman came to our office and said, look, when sitting at a bar with these Australian gentlemen, they were showing me pictures of all the research they were doing on uh, the, the drain lines and all the problems they were having and, and he got into this huge thing on waterless urinals and he brought out all these pictures and again this is about four years ago showing uh, the challenges that they were facing. So and th at the same time I know that IAPMO was interested in the same question and looking for opportunities to fund uh, research on this which I understand is uh, furthering along the research and getting more information about it. But I do think there is a lot of interest in figuring out what's the best approach. And that's just one side of it, the, you know, the carrying capacity of these drains. But in general, if we aren't developing, per se, new water, what are the best opportunities we have and lessons learned to be able to 
uh, maintain the water that we have. And, and, you know, I look forward to learning more. And I know that the folks, many of you folks have come through our office and, and we've been, uh, we've received a lot of information on opportunities that we may have in Congress to further incentivize and further study some of these opportunities that I, I know you're interested in pursuing. Would anyone else like to address that question? If not, I'd like to, I'd like to turn to some more uh, specific questions for, for individual members uh, of the panel. Uh, Hunter, I understand that the division you lead at, at NIST is focused on energy use and, and IAQ within buildings. What's the connection between water and energy? Okay, thank you. I think most of you have probably seen the movie Wedding Crashers. I feel like a plumbing crasher. <laughs> So I'm with this large group of plumbing experts and I'm an energy expert. But what, what I'd like to say is that, you know, energy usage of buildings is very significant to our water usage in the country. It turns out that buildings use 40% of all the energy that's used in our country, more than the transportation sector, more than, more than the industrial sector. And when I was asked to serve on this panel, I started doing a little bit of background work to try to translate that energy usage into water usage um, to produce the energy that's needed for those buildings. And I went to the USGS um, site and started digging around a little bit, and I was amazed that electricity production is actually accounts for 200,000 million gallons per day of water. It accounts for 40% of all the fresh water withdrawals. So this connection between building energy and water usage became much clearer to me. I like to just kind of translate that down to an individual home, which I think most of us could better identify with. Um, residential electrical energy consumption is about 35% of all the electrical energy consumption in the nation. The average household uses about 11,500 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. And it turns out that it takes about 23 gallons of water per every kilowatt hour of electricity production. That's according to the USGS and also using information from DOE's Energy Information Agency. So it turns out that each of us is responsible for about a quarter of a million gallons per year just to produce the electricity that we're using in the home. Not the, the context or the, infra, or the usage of water itself, which all of you are far more experts in. So I was amazed by this, and it really translated how important energy conservation is towards reducing not only our demand on the grid, our power plants, but also on our water supply. Um, so that's the connection that I see. Josh, with, with your background in, in federal water policy, what in your view can help uh, water efficiency and conservation efforts, both in the short term and the long term? Is this something that should be done at the federal level, the state level, or both? You know, as a, I'll speak from a Western water perspective, uh, it is a local issue. However, as you get up to uh, the, le the different levels of how water is managed uh, on the local, state, and then going from the federal level, there needs to be better you know, relationships amongst all entities. But I can tell you that any time the federal government gets engaged from a national perspective on water, it tanks. And it tanks from, in many cases, from both sides, uh, Republican and Democrat. You have so many folks who, depending on what region they're in, have don't necessarily like when the federal government is engaged in how they manage or what they believe ma how, man how water should be managed. A prime example is the EPA earlier this year, or I'm sorry, late last year, issued a notice that they were going to tr figure out the value of water. Let me tell you, we heard a lot of folks come before us saying, one, why is EPA interested in determining a national value for water? And, s and, and secondly, have they not looked at water cannot be valued at, across the nation at the same level? So currently the EPA is undergoing a study to determine what the value of water is. You also have other agencies interested in it, the Department of Interior the U through the USGS as well as the Bureau of Reclamation, the Corps of Engineers. You have a lot of agencies who are very interested in how water should be managed or could be managed and a lot of agencies studying what can and can't be done. 
And from a federal perspective, you'll see a lot of folks interested in uh, furthering the knowledge about w how much water we actually have. And a couple years ago, uh, Senator Domenici and Senator Bingham, and it's been a few years now, passed a bill that was called the Secure Water Act. Within that, they created a water census. And I would encourage you to look up at the, uh, the USGS and just Google water census. Right now, there's an undertaking by the Department of Interior to come up with a better understanding of how much water we have. Most of the thing, studies that people are basing their work upon about how much water we have is 15, 20 years old. They're trying to get a better hand of that. However, that's still a tricky situation when in most of the cases, uh, the water, uh, there's so many different folks who are measuring water from a state and local level that trying to get their arms around it is a challenge. But I do know from a federal perspective, we'll continue to, to try to address you know, the big issues and hoping that uh, if funding levels don't come through that there continues to be a lot of this creative ability to uh, better use the uh, limited resources that we do have. Well, you know, keeping in mind that, that everybody's uh, interested in water, at, you know, coming out at their local level, should the federal government or will the government, federal government have to act as a, as a referee between uh, these different interests, say the Great Lakes states and other parts of the country who, who want that water? I, I think one of the best ways that uh, states have worked through this is through compacts amongst states. I, I again, the federal government being uh, the referee on these in many cases has caused more challenges uh, in the short term. Sometimes in the long term, the work that was done has led to has led to changes. There's been several large initiatives that have been done in the West that, over many years of contemplating what was said and done, they've changed. But I uh, I, I do think that the best role is for folks to come up, you know, amongst. Uh, and when I say local, it can be as as far as the compacts amongst states, depending on the river sheds or the the watersheds that they share. Could I take a shot at that as well? The, uh, I mean, there are, there are numerous river basin compacts. One of the most recent uh, is the Great Lakes Water Resources Compact, uh, negotiated and approved by the eight uh, Great Lakes states in the latter part of this uh, last decade and uh, approved by uh, uh, Congress, uh, I think in 2008. Uh, so the, the, the Great Lakes Water Resources Compact specifically addresses the concern that that you raised, Mr. Moderator, um, about uh, out-of-state, out-of-basin usage, and even in-state out-of-basin usage, and sets criteria for evaluating those proposals. And in, the, in that compact, in order to approach this subject with, with clean hands, you might say, to, to discourage uh, sort of gratuitous transfers out of the Great Lakes Basin, the Great Lakes states themselves undertook the responsibility to develop conservation and efficiency criteria to ensure that uh, water would be used efficiently within the Great Lakes Basin. Now, many of the states, I think, uh, approached that subject without a whole lot of uh, knowledge or experience with what that meant. And uh, they're in the early years now in developing protocols for conservation and efficiency as well as a broader regulatory frame for, uh, for uh, permitting water uh, withdrawals within the Great Lakes Basin. It's a major undertaking, uh, but it's the kind of interstate collaboration that I think is, is uh, to be encouraged. Kevin, uh, according to GSA, its portfolio encompasses 370.2 million rentable square feet in 9,624 assets across the U.S in all 50 states, six U.S. territories, and the District of Columbia. That's, that's a lot of buildings and, and a daunting task to increase the government's efficiency. What is GSA currently doing to decrease water usage in its portfolio, and wh what challenges have you faced trying to do that? Uh, thank you. It's, I mean, first of all, the, uh, uh, as some of the fellow panelists pointed out, the potential for reducing water consumption in buildings is really pretty significant, um, especially when you focus on the, the consumption of potable water. Um, in 
heavily used air conditioning dominated climates, 50% maybe of the potable water in the building goes to the chillers and goes up in evaporation. So to the extent that we can use other sources of water uh, for that, it reduces the uh, consumption of potable use. We have dramatically reduced our use of potable water in landscaping. Our overall goal is to reduce that by uh, 90% over the between now and 2020. And we're actually achieving that mostly through use of uh, native plants. Uh, the side benefit of that is you use less water and the native plants require less maintenance. So the actual maintenance bills for landscaping tend to go down as well. Um, in the use of fixtures, it's relatively straightforward until we study what happens when we put in, let's say, dual flush toilet, my latest uh, little campaign here. Um, and we discover that there's a disconnect between the installation, the use, and the actual water consumption, because we don't find the same uh, level of savings that we would predict. Uh, in one case, we found that the handles, half of which in the building were actually installed upside down, so you didn't really know which way was the big flush and which way was the little flush. Um, we don't seem to have adopted the big button, little button idea so much in this country. Um, and the other thing, and I would demonstrate this if I only had a toilet out here, I'm surprised there isn't one. Um, in, in the building where I work, and I actually care about this, so I wanted to know which one they work, you have to put your nose in the toilet to read the instructions which are put on the wall so low, and it's not obvious. The other thing we find is that the natural uh, inclination of people is to push the lever down. Therefore, manufacturers should make down the default for the low flush, not the default for the large flush. And so a lot of it is this combination of installation, training, communications with people to actually achieve the water savings that are potential. And I guess the last thing that I would say is we're really have begun to look uh, partially uh, due to legislation which requires us to maintain the pre-development hydrology of sites undergoing major uh, construction renovation at the potential for using other sources of water. Uh, you mentioned gray water already, um, but also uh, capturing the rainwater and using that for multiple uses. So rainwater to the chillers, chillers to dechemicalize them using less chemicals in the chillers for or decalcification process so that we can then use those uh, for flushing. So multiple uses of water as we go through. And we find that you know, if, if you couple all those things together, both the education and the training, the really good design, and then sort of follow through to actually measure the performance, that you begin to start achieving those uh, substantial savings. You know, Kevin, uh, uh Two of our panelists, uh, or, or two of our, our presenters yesterday, including Bill Hoffman, who's in the back of the room there, um, gave a, a presentation talking about the, the trade-off between uh, with water and energy when the amount of water that's used by uh, cooling towers and water-cooled condensers. Where depending on what the water rates are, you might save five cents for the, by using a, a water-cooled air conditioner, but spend an extra six cents for the water depending on what the rate is in that area. Has GSA looked at that issue? Uh, yes, and I think that's one of the things that it is toughest to get across because you know, we focus very much on integrated design, but the industry hasn't until recently. Um, and, and so to get people in the different disciplines to look at the trade-offs between the decisions they're making, and, th and that goes you know, even beyond just the chiller usage. I mean, we can save more money on chillers and water by actually consuming less energy in the building overall by dealing with envelope issues. So it, it really starts at, at a holistic view of the building and then working in and then making those trade-offs in a sensible way. Maybe it's better to use a water-based chiller at one cent per gallon more or, you know, or per kilowatt hour or whatever it is, as long as you are sort of driving that total building look way down, and, 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 that's, and that's what we're, we're looking at. I mean, we, we just issued a, a challenge to energy savings performance country, companies. Uh, the federal government and generally in the United States, we achieve like a 20% uh, 
energy reduction through an energy savings performance contract, um, which can include water savings uh, in it, uh, we think that 70% is a much better goal. And so that's where we're trying to head. But you never get there by looking at pieces one technology at a time. You have to look at the integrated picture. Thank you. Kelly, uh, you have a, a unique skill set with a strong science background. Can you elaborate on your sense of, of the impact or importance of science and technology that play in crafting a sound policy relating to water issues? Yeah, just as an introduction, um, I'm a participant in the AAAS Science Policy Fellow Program, and AAAS stands for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They place somewhere between 30 and 35 uh, scientists on the Hill every year, um, and the, the scientists include um, PhDs, engineers, and, uh, and physicians. Uh, so we get placed in the offices to provide um, a science underpinning for decisions um, being being discussed uh, within the personal offices, um, in my case at the committee level. Um, and I've been, uh, coming from an oceanographic background, <clears throat> part of the reason I chose the committee was to, was to start exploring uh, how water and power are playing um, in, the, in the federal arena. Um, and as, a, a, as part of my background, I'm, I'm also a climate scientist and, and, and recognizing um, some of the impacts that are happening with extreme weather events that are causing droughts in some areas and, um, and higher precipitation in others and, and how that's going to play out uh, in the federal landscape. Uh, a couple of the things that have been happening at the committee level uh, since my tenure there, which is really pretty short, I've just been there nine months now, uh, but we've had three hearings that I think might be of interest. Um, the first one was in December on global water scarcity and some of the, techno um, the technological uh, solutions that are being proposed for for conservation, reuse, recycling. Um, we've also did a, just last week, I think, um, a hearing on the impacts of sea level rise on energy and water infrastructure, and I think that that's something that um, places like Florida and New York City are thinking about in terms of um, what kind of impact that's going to have on, on their water infrastructure moving forward and, and what kind of advanced planning is required. And the final hearing we did just a couple months ago was also on the Navy energy and water um, policies for efficiencies and, and some of the, the, the steps that they're taking to implement efficiencies that, um, at both their bases and uh, in the field to, to help um, reduce the need to transport fuel and water um, in places that might be hostile. Chris, uh, you know, working for, for Senator Reid, you're I know you're very familiar with Nevada water policies. Do you think that, that uh, Nevada-focused water policies will translate to a national level? Well, I think some of the, some of the techniques and technologies they're developing in Nevada will, will work in, unfortunately, more places than they currently do uh, as climate changes. Uh, eventually, Texas, West Texas is going to I mean, they're already working on energy conservation, but I think they're going to see, as the drought that they're experiencing deepens, I think they're going to realize that they may have to adapt some of the things, or adopt some of the things that uh, Nevada has developed over time. Um, I want to say one quick thing about what Kevin mentioned, and um, the, the amount of money that we put into the Recovery Act for green buildings and the things that GSA are doing are, are great uh, in terms of pushing the technology and the kinds of things that you all work on. It's unfortunate that the federal government hasn't done it before now, um, because there's been a there's a, a wide array of, of different agencies working on this. A lot of this is done by states uh, by the states themselves, Southern Nevada Water Authority, but the federal government hasn't had a long history of working on the kinds of technologies and the science that deal with water conservation and efficiency that we wish we we had, because we're going to see greater instability in water supply and quality as we move forward in the future. Um, so it's going to be more and more important that, uh, I think, not that the federal government be a referee or, or necessarily be the man, uh, mandator, um, but that there be programs, integrated programs across all the federal agencies with jurisdiction that they're working um, uh, to, to be more adaptive uh, and to develop 
uh, more technologies that are going to allow for water security on a building level and a community level that we currently don't have and we're really not prepared for at this point. Um, so hopefully not everyone will have to experience what Southern Nevada uh, is dealing with and do those things, but uh, the odds are that more parts of the country are going to have to deal with that kind of water insecurity. Ed, I, I'd like you to talk about leaks. Um, leaks from uh, utility distribution systems, uh, customer appliances, uh, and piping in homes. Uh, what technologies, practices, or policies is NRDC promoting to reduce water lo loss through leakage, either from uh, the utility side of the meter or uh, in the customer's pr premises or both? Um, we have been taking a look at leakage. It's, it's uh, widespread, uh, and whether it comes from either the distribution system or the customer side, it's however inevitable it is, it's, it's wasteful. And, and, and steps should be taken to reduce it wherever it's cost effective. Um, we're looking at four policies relating to uh, leakage. Uh, one is to improve the accuracy of customer water meters. Um, it's um, maybe surprising to some, but um, the, uh, the accuracy of water meters uh, declines um, pretty significantly uh, as the flow rate through the meter drops to very low levels. And um, low levels that are indicative of leakage uh, often go unrecorded. They're, they're, not, they're not picked up on the meter when there's no other purposeful use. And if you think about how, how much purposeful use there is in water in a residence, um, it may be just a couple hours a day in, in terms of actual running time. If you have sprinklers on a timer, it might be a little bit longer. Uh, but for most customers, it's just going to be a, a couple hours a day. So there's 21, 22 hours where uh, there's no purposeful use being drawn through the service connection. The only thing that may be happening is, is leakages coming through, leakage coming through at very low levels, not being recorded, not being picked up on the customer water bill. And in many cases, these leaks are not visible to the consumer. Uh, they may not be visible or audible until they become uh, quite large. So they go un, un, uh, unaddressed, and the cost of, of that water, which has to be paid for and recovered by the utility, gets socialized to all customers. So more accurate uh, water meters are, you know, a, a, I think a basic component uh, to a strategy, to uh, a long-term strategy to help uh, reduce uh, leakage. Increasing the frequency of meter reading through automation, through automated metering infrastructure, or AMI, uh, is another approach that will really help uh, in the uh, reduction of leakage. With the automated uplift of data from the meter that you can get through, a, that you can collect through an AMI system, um, it's possible to take uh, uh, very granular uh, readings of uh, uh, water consumption say at hourly intervals, rather than monthly or 60-day intervals getting a bill, uh, consumers and utilities can see water consumption at hourly intervals or even 15-minute intervals. And by looking at, at uh, nighttime periods where, again, purposeful water use is assumed to be uh, uh, limited or uh, turned off, uh, utilities can spot uh, patterns of consumption that appear to be indicative of leakage and then can notify consumers without having to wait for a 30-day or 60-day uh, billing period. And utilities that have, have instituted AMI typically get these, these uh, data, customer data management systems that will allow them to ping their customers when, uh, when these kinds of patterns of consumption show up. So that's a very effective strategy. Of course, there's there's a larger element to building the business case for a utility to invest in AMI. It's expensive, um, but there are other kinds of uh, cost savings as well as the benefits to uh, customers to be able to uh, spot uh, leaks. On the utility side, uh, we really see advantages in uh, more widespread use of the uh, newest uh, methodology for assessing and accounting for water losses in the distribution system 
that has been uh, developed and published through the American Water Works Association uh, and their new manual M36 uh, and the use of free water audit software that's available to any AWWA utility member. Actually, it's available to anybody uh, uh, that can be downloaded and, and used to effectively categorize the, the uses of water within the system and what used to be a considered unaccounted for water uh, now becomes fully accounted for and the losses in the system are identified. That looks to be a very promising approach, uh, a new way of thinking about uh, managing uh, uh, distribution system uh, losses and um, we're encouraging states to, to uh, get on board and to uh, require utilities to uh, to engage in annual uh, assessments of distribution system losses using the uh, freeware from AWWA and having the states having the ability to roll up this data uh, statewide. Be a very effective strategy for daylighting where the, where the issues are with um, distribution system losses. Hunter, I, I want to ask you about the uh, the net zero energy residential test facility that's being constructed. Could, could you fill us in on the project and, and how can uh, plumbing products and other technologies help in achieving net zero? Okay. Um, we're currently building at NIST a net zero energy residential test facility and this facility is being built with the primary objective of demonstrating that a home typical in size and aesthetics to homes in the surrounding communities around the Washington DC area can achieve net zero energy. That's, that's being accomplished uh, through three different traditional means towards lowering energy consumption. One is by uh, ensuring that the thermal envelope is as efficient as possible using energy efficient technologies and then finally the use of renewables to bring it to zero. Um, when we talk about building energy consumption, it's always the most economical means to use energy conservation first. Typically you can get 30 to 50 percent reducing your building energy consumption. Use of building energy efficient technologies can usually get you 20 to 30 next. And then finally the use of renewables. As, as Kevin was mentioning, the thing that's critical in all of this is designed as a system. When we designed the net zero energy residential test facility, it's based upon hundred of, hundreds of computer simulations to make sure that all of these technologies, the building envelope or the building shell, as many of you may call it, works in a synergistic manner to reduce the energy consumption of the building itself. The house is set up <clears throat> so it actually mimics a family of four. There's a eight-year-old, a 14-year-old, and two working adults that are mimicked in this home. So every 15 minutes, their movement is, occurs through the house. Appliances are turned on and off. Showers take place. Water usage takes place. It's based on DOE has a Building America program where they have gone out and monitored the energy use patterns and the water use patterns patterns of typical family. So the, all of this is automated within the house. The reason that we use mimic people versus actual people is pretty obvious and that we can predict their behavior, unlike us. So the house during the first year of operation, it, 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 the construction will be completed within a month or so. The house gets turned over to NIST. It's on our campus in Gaithersburg, Maryland. The house will become uh, instrumented and operational and by the first of next year we're actually beginning the um, capture of data to prove that this house is net zero. It then becomes a research laboratory. The house was designed by 50 or so energy researchers at NIST along with contributors from the Department of Energy and it's set up with multiple systems within the home. For example, even though they're not utilized during the first year of operation, there's three different geothermal earth loops around the home that we can look at the efficiency of various earth coupled systems. Multiple duct systems in the home. Probably more of interest to you is each fixture, there's a solenoid that controls the water flow to each water fixture within the home so that we can mimic the operation. And I see it as a vehicle, although I've never really thought about it before until I got the call to attend this. There would be a, a, a vehicle that could be used to look at energy, um, I'm sorry, water saving uh, 
fixtures within the home. Since we're mimicking the operation anyway, it will be easy to reproduce that operation while changing out the various water fixtures within the home. So the purpose of it is, the objective of it is to demonstrate net zero energy for a typical home in size and aesthetics, pr uh, provide a research vehicle for future energy research, but m my vision has been broadened a little bit by being here, and I think it could also be used to look at various water saving uh, fixtures in the future. Josh, 40 years ago, Congress uh, created the, the National Water Commission to, to study present and, and future anticipated water resource problems. Would it make sense to, to form such a commission again? It kind of goes back to the earlier response. On any time that you structure an organization that is at a national level to address water concerns, it really does cause discomfort in Congress. And it in many cases, it is coming from the localities and states that folks really fear that if you have a federal agency or a, fed a group that represents all federal agencies dictating water policy nationwide, uh, it raises issues, whether they're real or not. Uh, several years ago, starting I guess in the late 90s, there was in the House an initiative by a Georgia congressman, uh, Republican, to set up a commission. And every two years it was reintroduced, and since that time this member is, has retired. But it was a bill that kept getting modified and modified to encourage that uh, folks to recognize this is just to better understand how federal agencies can work together to be aware of what agencies are doing and how that may impact uh, water policy throughout the country and it came upon deaf ears. And I don't know at what time folks will want to have a policy, a commission set up like that. It may depend upon what role it has. Right now you have agencies that do meet to discuss water. However, it is not a formal, similar to the commission that was structured you know, over 30 years ago, or that ended uh, slightly over, I guess it's been almost uh, three decades. Uh, at least two decades, that the having another commission like that, I don't know if uh, yet the country is ready for a, you know, a, more, a, formal, a formal commission like that. I do, though, believe that agencies need to come together better to discuss what they're doing on sustainability. And a prime example is each agency is required to, a federal agency, develop sustainability plans for their own buildings and their own actions. Each agency has different ways of approaching water and energy within their facilities and within their policies. And so there needs to be some recognition, at least internally within the federal government, how you do this. And then likely, I assume when we get to that level, that they might be more alert to some of the issues that could be more nationalized. Hey, Kevin, you, you not only have a, a whole lot of buildings, you have a whole lot of people. How do you make sure that the right people get the right information about the latest technologies and, and best practices? Um, getting information into the right people's hands is half the battle. The other half of the battle is putting it into um, terms and methods and ways of delivering that really make sense to the people who are receiving it. Um, one, of, one of the initiatives in, in our office right now is we've been looking at the adoption rates of uh, research on buildings, on building technologies, on building operations, and we're discovering over and over again the research is really good, it's ready for prime time, and it's not adopted in practical use. Um, part of the problem is that if you read any good research report, the final paragraph says, well, we have shown this, 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 and the next step is more research is needed. Um, the minute somebody who's a building operator reads more research is needed, they conclude, oh, well, I can't rely on this because more research is needed. So we're sort of systematically sifting through what we think are the high impact areas and trying to put it in, uh, in, in ways that people are, use. I mean, we're, we're sort of looking at social media. We're looking at uh, things like YouTube to really get, you know, there's going to be a picture of somebody trying to read the toilet uh, signs that are in, you know, 
eight point type on the wall behind the handle to try and show that and just to get some practical stuff out there. Um, and it's not, it's not a GSA issue. I mean, we're looking through uh, our work on the Federal Building Personnel Training Act at everybody who is operating buildings today. And I mean, the big thing that we find in building operations is that, uh, as somebody said on a panel recently, um, the time that the building operates the best is right when it gets turned over to the building manager and before anybody moves in, and then it deteriorates from there. Um, we're finding as we go back and look at buildings that sustainable green buildings do in fact perform better, but they don't perform up to their potential. No building today, I would argue, is performing up to their potential. Buildings today in the United States use about the same energy that they used 20 years ago. 25 years ago. It just hasn't changed and yet the technology has changed and our building has changed. Uh, so really getting those words out and then the key I think in this is much more systematic measurement. One of the things that uh, we have been doing across the government is putting in advanced meters, advanced meters, time of day meters, interval meters to check on both energy water and energy water and steam. As we do this we're discovering all kinds of things. My favorite story is the time when we couldn't figure out about the um, electrical usage on weekends at one of our campuses until we found out that it was a construction site next door that had actually gone under our fence, tapped into our electricity, and was using it on their construction site. So yeah, that was theft, but the point is that if you get a monthly bill, you can't tell that kind of stuff. Um, we did snip the line very quickly. Um, and uh, that caused some surprise. We waited until Monday m midday to, to do that, just to make the impact. But I mean, that, it's, it's that kind of information and really going back and measuring and, and, and discovering. That's how you discover the leakages. That's how you discover things that get left on. That's how you discover that, you know, somebody has a two by four in the damper because that was the only way to do a temporary fix until they actually got the part and then the two by four just stayed there for years you know and that, these kind of things happen you don't find out about that stuff unless you measure very very carefully there is a huge gap between the degree of technology in buildings today and the training and experience of the people operating the buildings. And we're trying to bridge that gap in a number of different ways. But, uh, you know, in, in just to do one comparison, for every person who gets a university college degree in facility management in the United States, Germany graduates 250. It's a different approach to what kind of skill set do we need to operate the building. We need to probably pay these people more, uh, and we will save money in doing that. And I think that's, that's pretty clear. And people are beginning to see that, uh, not just in the government, but in the private sector, that investing in the proper operation of buildings is a good way to reduce overall cost of operations. And we're finding that the, the, you know, the paybacks on that kind of investment are very, very short. The next question could be answered by either Kelly or Chris uh, from, from your work in the, in the Senate. What are the priorities of these senators when it comes to water issues? What are, are, are they doing anything to drive the agenda for water issues? Would, would relevant committees hold hearings on these? I'll just answer really briefly. Uh, part of my job is to, is to support the efforts of the Subcommittee on Water and Power, and, um, and a number of the hearings that I mentioned earlier um, are um, were initiated by Senator Jean Shaheen from New Hampshire. So um, while there might not be a lot of active legislation, there is an active dialogue. Um, so um, people are in a, in a learning environment and trying to understand um, some of the impacts that um, extreme weather or, or global water scarcity will have um, in the future. So that's from, from my limited perspective. I mentioned earlier that the outlook for legislation was, was kind of dim, but um, there is a prospect of moving the Portman Shaheen bill. We, we're hoping that we can uh, maybe work out some kind of a time agreement to limited relevant amendments or something that has to do with efficiency, water efficiency, um, energy efficiency, move, move forward on something like that. Senator Reid would, he loves to legislate, would like to have things on the floor, but um, a lot of times is, if anybody's watching lately, it, 
turns into less about the bill that's on the floor than it does about the, the elections coming up. So it's an election year, and that makes everything a lot more complicated. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the, the effort, uh, the initiative that's uh, supported by uh, the American Institute of Architects uh, and the U.S. Conference of Mayors called the, the 2030 Challenge. Uh, for new buildings to be carbon neutral by 2030. Uh, has NRDC considered the steps needed to make a, a similarly dramatic reduction in water use in new buildings over that same time frame? Yeah, I alluded to that earlier. We, uh, we think that's entirely possible. The, uh, the uh, initiative on uh, zero net uh, carbon neutral uh, buildings is uh, uh, I think a great example of, of a combination of networking, uh, organizing, uh, technology coming together. And we think the same thing can happen with regard to water use. And if we are able to bring, make dramatic breakthroughs in the, the water use of new um, buildings, particularly new residential buildings, I think we can see uh, water consumption in, at the community level uh, level off, even in growing communities. And, uh, for, and have substantial benefits from the standpoint of, of infrastructure cost savings. Anybody in the audience have questions for our panel members? We've got one in the back here. I've always got one. Craig Silover from Masco Corporation. I think for Hunter, I was very interested to hear about the net zero energy model home that you're that you're doing. Um, I've been working with uh, a lot of people on the hot water side of things. Yeah. And in good uh, buildings made with good building science principles and so forth, it would appear that we're starting to be energy efficient in terms of heating and cooling to the point where uh, water heating can be almost as large an energy usage as the heating and cooling piece. And so uh, in your model, what I'm wondering is, uh, through some uh, home water use study work that we did, um, in going with uh, um, water scents for homes, uh, showers, and faucets in particular, which dispense hot water along with cold, um, I'm, I'm thinking that we're going to see something on the order of a 15 to 20%, give or take, uh, reduction in uh, hot water heating energy use through uh, hot water demand reduction. So I'd be really interested if that's going to be a piece down the road that you're experimenting with in the home. And then the other question is, is did you insulate the hot water pipes? Yeah, certainly. Okay, so the, the question is to the second answer is certainly all the hot water pipes are insulated. It's PEX tubing from each individual fixture down to a central manifold where we have solenoids to control each usage. But the first point is really interesting because what you find is, is, is you reduce the heating and cooling load of buildings, loads that weren't dominant suddenly become dominant. For example, plug loads, you know, plug the um, auxiliary loads, the, the um, satellite boxes in our homes, the, you know, the computers, the printers sitting around, the cell phone chargers, all that stuff. You know, when you start moving, you, you start designing the home so that the building envelope is so well insulated, suddenly those heating and cooling loads drop dramatically and things that you have ignored in the past become the dominant sense of the load. The other thing that's really interesting about as you move towards net zero is your cooling load becomes so small in a climate where you have to deal with humidity that conventional means of reducing humidity in a building are no longer appropriate. You know, we currently rely upon our air conditioners to wring out the load, the moisture load, the latent load within buildings. And as you move that cooling load to lower and lower amounts, it becomes more difficult to do that. So the whole building design um, history, the collective knowledge of the partitioners suddenly changes. And, and certainly um, in the future, the, the, I guess to follow up with your final question, the building could be used to look at various water saving fixtures and the impact that they have on the energy usage of the building itself. Thank you. We have another question in the back. Yeah, Josh, I had a, a comment, I guess. I, I really enjoyed the story about California and the fact that with the threatened legislation for a decade, they ended up with innovation that was as good as and maybe better than legislation. 
And I was wondering if there were lessons learned that had been applied in the government to minimize legislation and facilitate innovation because innovation can be driven better locally. It's a hard question. We, we debate this continually is where should money be put federal dollars? Do you put it into you know, infrastructure funding or do you put it into research funding and what agencies should be involved? Who should do it? Should it go out to labs? Should it go out to different groups who have the ability to do so? I honestly believe, having worked up there, that the more work that can be done within the states or with outside of federal input, in many cases, the better off we all are. And I, and I use the California example in that in the end, what pushed that bill to be passed was Silicon Valley decided that, you know, every time that we get some water that is a little poor out of the delta in Northern California, we have to re reconfigure our, our machines for the chip manufacturing. And in, in so causing the problem that they were getting bad water when the pumps were on moving the water or when they weren't on, they had to develop innovative ideas on how do you address the processing of chips. And I think that in the end it helped push our legislation to be passed because they wanted a reliable water supply, but because they didn't have a reliable water supply, they had to innovate. And California has been, you know, I'd really encourage you to look, you know, as bad as in many cases what California does, uh, because of what they put themselves through, there are many lessons learned on what they, in order to to try to get at something without knowing what you're trying to get at, they've been fairly innovative in many ways. And I look at the examples of Southern California on how they manage water. Uh, they've also, I think, failed miserably in many ways, and they've set goals that can't be met. And I think those challenges are, are seen uh, from a fiscal standard uh, out in California. And we find it as well in the federal government. We get engaged in setting standards for products, legislatively. I mean, when, when was the last time you wanted folks who weren't necessarily technical writing standards for your products? We do that more often than not. And I think the last place that you really want your issues resolved, particularly as it comes to what can be done or should be done, is not necessarily through our offices. And I would, uh, you know, going back to the California example, what happens so often, and it's water issues as well as power issues, energy issues, they pass some standard that requires the uh, manufacturers to make something that exceeds nationwide the standard. And then we have to come in and figure out a way to address what California did. And sometimes it's productive. In many cases, it's not. And so as you look at uh, opportunities as you develop the standards, I think the process that you undertake through the, you know, the consensus approach and then coming to Congress saying, look what we've done, is a huge help. And uh, hopefully we can take those examples in some of our hearings as we try to legislate, in some cases, things that can't be done. We have time for two more questions from Rob Zimmerman and Bob Bulware. Bob, why don't you go first? Thank you. Increasingly, we hear about what the government's doing in greening the, the, the government uh, in the name of uh, rainwater catchment. Uh, by way of identification, I'm a consulting engineer from uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, design air engineering, and national president of the American Rainwater Catchment Association. Uh, specifically, uh, you're talking about rainwater catchment in, in a lot of your embassies around the world. Uh, ARCSA represents arguably the, the best trained people in the country and increasingly around the world that we have representatives in. South Africa, Mexico, Philippines, and, and Canada. How, uh, what's, what's a better way than the SF330 process for you to know about us uh, and we to know about your, what your needs are? And I think that could be interpreted as a, a generic question to, to a lot of product manufacturers in the room. You know, I, uh, I'll take a crack at this. Um, we spend a fair amount of time uh, talking to all kinds of manufacturers, all kinds of service delivery people, all time, uh, times of consultant to try and figure out the best way to capture 
emerging technologies, emerging practices, and get them in, into practice. Um, there's a lot going on across the building industry, and I don't think that um, the building industry as a whole does a great job of consolidating that information. Um, it's a very fragmented industry. There's lots of conflicting claims. And it's kind of tough when you get down to, you know, I'm a, I'm a building manager, I have to replace X, and I've got all of this product display. Where can I go for sort of some kind of authoritative information? One of the, uh, one of the things we rely on a lot is both voluntary and consensus-based standards. Uh, we're also looking uh, systematically at, at product standards and eco-labels and a systemic way of adopting those in the procurement vehicles in the government. Sometime in the next couple of months, that will be out for everybody's public comment. So I think that will be an improvement uh, in over what we're doing uh, right now. Um, and lastly, I guess I would in, in, encourage there, uh, the... Um, people to come into um, the two really big procurement agencies of the government, which are GSA and the Department of Defense, and look at the most effective way that we receive information. Uh, we've got a group in GSA called Industry Relations that gets you, sort of tries to make the contact between uh, people who are selling and people who are buying in an effective way. It's sort of a primer of getting through. It's not necessarily a technology assessment piece. Um, and then the, the final bit is that we definitely rely very heavily on the work of uh, both NIST and the Department of Energy and all of the uh, national labs for sort of authoritative information on emerging technologies. And so making sure that anything uh, you're doing gets in front of everybody who's involved that way, I, I think is, is probably an effective way in. I, I don't think anything that I've said is a magic bullet to, to solve this issue. Um, one of the things that we do uh, also, and, and as we're working with the Federal Building Personnel Training Act, is we're going to be making a connection between anybody who does accredited training in the private sector and the skills and, and uh, competencies that we've identified for uh, people operating buildings and, and make those connections very publicly available. So it's going to be a public website that you will be able to register courses in. So it's a, a way to get education out in a very broad way. And, and all we're doing is making the connection. We're not sitting here to judge whether course A is better than course B. We're trying to make the connection between the people who need the training and the training that's out there in the private sector. And that's sort of the, the glue that we're trying to put in in a kind of very open and transparent way. I hope that helped a little. We're running short on time. Rob, do you have a quick question? It will be quick. Uh, this is actually directed to Kevin Campshire. Uh, I think what's going on in the uh, uh, federal government and building efficiency is probably one of the most significant things um, in energy efficiency and green building uh, that the general public doesn't know about. And I was wondering if you are collecting data on not only the efficiency, but also the dollars saved, the taxpayer dollars saved, and what the plans are of GSA or the federal government to share that information with the public. Um, I think. That's hugely important. Um, energy.data.gov uh, is up. There's a lot of information on what's going on in energy consumption. We're making more and more data sets available. I think you're going to see a lot of emphasis on that. We're very carefully collecting information on the effectiveness of specific technologies on you know, a, a rigorous research uh, basis. And additionally, we're, we're collecting sort of the effectiveness of different strategies on a more average portfolio uh, basis. We're trying to collect that information not only from GSA's uh, individual experience, but also the experience of other agencies in the government, uh, particularly um, in the United States, the Army and the Navy, who have very large installations here and, and are pretty good at collecting data on a different scale. 
uh, than GSA. Uh, as we get more towards things like advanced metering, we get much, much better uh, data sets. Um, what you can look at right now on energy.data.gov, for example, is the monthly bills. That tells you one level of information. When you can look at the interval bills, then that's a very different level of information. Uh, and we're being careful that there are some security concerns at putting this kind of information out publicly. So in some cases, the information is aggregated so the very specific installations can't be discerned for security reasons. But that's, that's all stuff that uh, people have solved. So I, I'm hopeful that you'll see more and more of that uh, out in the public realm. Okay, I'd like to uh, thank our esteemed panelists for taking time out of their schedules to be with us here today. Uh, at this time, a buffet lunch is outside in the, uh, in the corridor, and we will begin promptly at 1 o'clock.